On the docket today, we'll recap the cause of gravity. Uh, we're going to correct an error on Newton's T that I made in my last video. We're going to explain the E equals MC Einstein fraud. And we're going to give a solution to the entropy paradox where every action or reaction increases the entropy in the universe. So how did it get ordered in the first place? We're going to answer that question. OK. Now we've covered the proof of internal expansion as the cause of gravity many times. If you've seen any of my videos, you've heard that. But every listener has to have that firmly under his belt. So every time you're going to get a short recap. If you don't need that, skip ahead to the matter of Newton's G and Einstein's famous E equals MC squared fraud. Uh, and the entropy question, I'll explain how the equation was similarly plagiarized to the pound Rebka example, which we'll also talk about, and why the energy released from nuclear reactions has nothing to do with conversion of mass to energy. <sighs> we will also solve the entropy paradox by providing the correct answer to how order in the universe is restored recycled in violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Yes, there is one, but one only perpetual motion machine that drives a cosmic machine, the only one anyone ever has seen. These are not amateur theories or my personal ideas, but they're drawn directly from the thoughts of, from the laws of physics that have been ignored in the misplaced zeal to establish Einstein as the greatest scientist of all time. So herein, courtesy of Alan Fuss, are the only correct and the most important laws of physics not found anywhere else on the planet so far. So focus your attention, please. Thank you. So let's examine once again the pound replica experiment, which you can see plainly was falsely cited as a validation of Einstein's relativity or one of his predictions. If you go, like, go to Google, uh, Google at Wiki Pound Rebka to match up with this discussion, and you can follow along there. Otherwise, I'm just taking out of it to show you what's in there. That's all. The experiment, okay. Uh, to explain, it was meant to prove that there's a fractional reduction in clock speed over the distance h from point A to point B towards the Earth. And this is going to be done by measuring the fractional reduction in wavelength of light. This is a blue shift going down or red shift going up. OK, this is our common gravitational red shift, which by definition would correspond to reduction in clock speed because light is defined in terms of so many wavelengths over a certain period. So if the wavelength and the, well, they'll both shrink together, the wavelength and the clock speed, the distance of a meter also changes, okay? So by definition, by definition of a meter, it corresponds to a reduction in the length of the meter. But this aspect of the, meter, of the experiment is ignored in this article. Okay, as a matter of fact, it's just plain ignored. Instead, the proof of Einstein's relativity is displayed with this complex formula, which you can see here, which is to represent the fractional reduction in frequency over distance h. And this fraud, and you see it's a fraud, like all of Einstein, consists of a complex equation that is mathematically sound. See, he's going to suck you into that, and you can't find anything wrong with the math, but it has no corresponding physical meaning other than what he just pushes out of his ass. 
Do you see anything about clock speed in there? Well, no, of course. See, so there in his Einstein's form, you know, because you know, they assume that you know that a reduction of clock speed will re or a reduction in frequency will reduce the clock speed. Well, they don't say anything about the length, and then they don't say anything about clock speed either. They stop right there. Uh, by the way, they plagiarize Newton's g in this formula. That represents the force of attraction between two masses. Do you see two variables for mass? <laughs> no. So the endeavor is only to astound you with a complex equation that can't be ruled correct, but which is any, any empty, empty of any corresponding physical meaning. But you just go, wow, this guy is God. He knows everything. That's, that's what they've done with Einstein. They've turned him into a god. You know, when he speaks bullshit, you know, bullshit that comes out of his mouth. The wiki articles then discard Einstein's formula because they claim H is negligible in it. And who are you going to tell me this isn't a fraud? Okay. No, they just, they say this is proof and then they throw it out. You can't say it isn't fraud. H is the crux of the experiment. It's the change in clock speed over the distance H. So the claim they make about Einstein is a blatant fraud. Look at it. Of course, we can figure out for ourselves that a change in frequency translates to a change in clock speed. Okay, so we'll give them that, you know, but they don't explain it. Or that there's a change in length as well, as well as a change in the speed of light itself, all proportional together, because as you move equidistant from, well, as space expands, you don't see the expansion, but the expansion requires a change in clock speed, a change in frequency, and an increase in the distance of a meter. Okay, all that's done here is one of Newton's formulas, one or more, have been, in, have been robbed to invent a bogus one and twist it around to make it appear that one or more dis discoveries have been made that matches these experimental results, but they don't, you see. They don't. Now, isn't that crazy? So after admitting the irrelevance of Einstein's formula, it's tossed out. And then Newton's formula for potential energy is used to calculate a shift in frequency except neither frequency or clock speed are ever mentioned again, even though that was the point of it. Right? <laughs> Slid right out from under it. Slick devils, aren't they? Yeah, that's a shell game. So instead, both of the variables are dropped and replaced with E for energy. Okay, this is just a dodge used to affirm Einstein's explanation of uh, red and blue shift uh, from bodies of mass as being a gravitational effect, change in energy. And that explains it. No, it doesn't. But the equation is also in, in the incorrect form, so it can impress you. You see this everywhere you go, all this, uh, wow, wow, you know, we're going to really snow these guys. The calculated, um, the calculated result in the equation is okay. That's all right. Okay, but the proper way to express this is with a capital delta, not a little delta, which means instantaneous change because this isn't instantaneous change, it should change over the distance h. You see, so you see the way they, they, they play with your mind? They treat you like a real idiot. <laughs> I suppose apparently everybody is, <laughs> but, but maybe a precious few of us. Okay, so then the variable for frequency and r, uh, it should be used instead of E so that we show a reduction in clock speed, okay? And a capital delta, okay? So we have an overall change. And then that would fix it. But the fact that L for defined length of a meter and the speed of light C are also affected is ignored. And we need not to ignore those things. These are crucial facts that underpin the true facts of what causes gravity and how the universe really functions. Here I've completed the proof of reduced clock speed uh, in algebraic terms. 
that the wiki article failed to complete. So we just replace Einstein's meaningless instantaneous change in energy with the correct capital delta R for change in clock speed equal to GH over C squared. Okay. Because that's how it that's how it comes out when you substitute into Newton's formula. So then we just change this. We we simplify this to a change in clock speed equal to the initial clock speed r sub naught times a change in velocity over the speed of light. Really simple formula. Okay, so that's our little QED. This is what the pound rep experiment proved: a clock speed r is reduced by the fractional increase in velocity due to Newton's gravitational potential energy formula. Capital delta R, change in clock speed, is then equal to the initial clock speed, R sub naught, times the change in velocity over the speed of light. And we're talking about with potential energy, of course, the change of velocity over, a, over the period of time that the object fell. OK. Now I've got another. Uh, page I want to show you. And uh, I've explained this before. So, so this is the um, my Fuse's law of clock speed and dimensions. But of course, I have nothing to do with this whatsoever. I'm just writing down the facts on one page that we just went over. And these things will prove the expansion spatial internal spatial expansion model of, or cause of gravity and that is a model of the universe it's all the same thing it's how the, it's how the universe unfolds it's what powers the universe and yes it's fact that's what you know they have they've they've bamboozled you and, and shifted your attention to einstein the great hero and you know, why all that happened, I don't know, don't ask me. Okay. So we have clock speed is reduced by the fractional increase in velocity due to I, Newton's gravitational potential energy formula. Okay. So we can, we, we, we can see then that light or length also and the wavelength of light and the velocity of light all of those things change simultaneously by definition. Okay, I didn't make this up, it's not my idea. It's by definition and by proof of the experiment. It didn't validate the Einstein, nothing like that. It validated this. All these things have to be inferred from the change in clock speed because they're physical facts. Okay, so this page derives and summarizes these facts admitted in the Wiki article. So we can see them all in one place. We can derive the correct relationships. Just and of course, none of these things are predicted as as is claimed for Einstein. But anyway, we know that a meter is defined by the number of wavelengths over a certain period of time t. So if the frequency of light doubles, clock speed must be half for a meter to still be correctly defined and the meter itself would only end up half as long. Despite it still remaining a meter by definition locally and there's no, all the laws of physics remain the same. You see, as long as As long as you're at a constant, uh, what you would call uh, potential energy, you're in a constant gravitational gradient. All you know, the more you expand, in other words, it doesn't matter. All the laws of physics are going to be the same, no matter how much the meter stick grows or no how much the meter shrinks, even in the middle of a black hole. Yeah. So these equations all represent the known physical facts that can be argued. And what do they mean? Well, listen to what I'm saying. What, listen to what they're saying, please. 
Understand that they describe what happens to light as it leaves the Earth. It accelerates into an expanding space. This isn't perceived on the local level, but we know it's true because we see the, the red shift going out and blue, blue shift coming in tell us the space is expanding, the clock speeds are increasing as you we don't see space expanding, see, because you're part of the expansion. Space is expanding in proportion to mass or mass density. Everything expands at once. So that's what the pound Repka experiment proves that meter stick grows as you're leaving space. And it's not a static thing, it's a real expansion. Because light isn't composed of mass, the increase in wavelength tells you exactly what the rate of recession is between you and this other object, even though you measure the distance is being fixed. That's what accounts for the redshift that the physicists see out there, the fixed distance redshift that they see within our galaxy. They just call it gravitational redshift. It's not, it's Doppler redshift. But you don't see it because you're inside the box. Right? Yeah, you definitely are. So these equations, you know, they can't be argued. And that's what they mean. They don't mean anything else. Because as light accelerates into the expanding space and accelerates and expands at the same time, it's not, to, it can't be perceived by within the dimension of space-time. We could call it space-time. Dimensions are fixed even though space is expanding. And we'll, you'll, get, you'll understand why, because when everything expands at once, there's no perception of that expansion on the local level or right inside the box. Let's say, okay. So here, uh, just a minute. Okay, well here I compare a, this is taken right from a textbook. This is a textbook example of gravitational redshift on the top area. That um, to, uh, it's a textbook example of gravitational redshift, I guess, to, and I turn that into a better example, which includes the fact of, of the accelerating space, which we know from Pound Ripka, that is seen in this progressive redshift in clock speed. It's an accelerating shift in the beginning because space is expanding. Clock speed is increasing in an accelerating fashion, which tapers off with the square of the distance from the source. So it disappears, the acceleration peters off fairly quickly, and then objects are. Um, Weightless. So looking at light going up away from the Earth, instead of down, we find that light shifts towards a redder frequency at the same rate, it also accelerates at the opposite rate of falling bodies. The added wavelength is matched by the expansion of length and increase in clock speed and acceleration of light velocity. Okay, exactly as we saw in the diagram. Exactly what the pound Rebka experiment tells us if we give it time, if we think about it. The outward expansion of space as measured by a meter correctly matches the acceleration of light and equal and opposite acceleration due to gravity. But the expansion is not experienced internally because dimensions are fixed because of clock speeds and, and length, the definition of. Inside, everything is fixed. The redshift tells you how far they're receding away from each other. But the expansion is not experienced internally, at least if it's uniform. But if the expansion accelerates, then it's pushing other space away. And so it recedes faster, it accelerates. And as it accelerates, it exerts an equal and opposite force of gravity, according to Newton's 
third law. Every action creates an equal and opposite reaction. That's exactly what happens. That's what the experiment is telling you. There's only one way you can interpret these facts. The gravity is the equal and opposite reaction to the action of expanding its space according to Newton's third law, because that's what the measurements all say. So why this correct conclusion was never made is not entirely clear, but an inflamed zealous media obsessed with turning Einstein into a god enabled this fraudulent flim flam of Einstein to overrule the truth and usher, usher in a long era of fraudulent cosmology of scientific darkness. So this single page summary proves gravity is the opposite action of space into an, an external void. You say you can't see it? The expansion is not observed or experienced inside the box because all of space expands at once at a rate equal to ambient mass density. So light is not mass. And so the Doppler formulas can be used to measure the rate of expansion of the box itself, the rate of the expansion of space between any two points, the relative rates of expansion, not the expansion as a whole of the whole universe, but the relative rates of expansion tell it, the redshift tells us what that rate of expansion is, but it's fixed inside the box. There's no such thing as gravitational redshift. This is synonymous with the rate of recession between any two points in the universe. And where gravity is of an effect, it's in, it gives you the rate of falling bodies that is the gravitational potential. It gives you the gravitational potential, P equals MGH, okay? Incidentally, cosmic expansion, of course, not only is the cause of gravity, but note that this expansion is what drives the clock forward and is responsible for the passage of time. Look at the data. Think about it. Let it talk to you. This isn't delusion. I'm not in that case. This is what the data said. And it's anything about Einstein. You can see that. Be honest. Okay, so here's another illustration that should help you understand why the meter stick expands away from Earth without that expansion being measurable within the box. This is just another way of looking at it. Assume we have a, a spherical universe, okay, inside this yellow sea of infinite void or energy or whatever it is. Note that as every point within the universe, as the universe expands as a whole, if everything is expanding, the raisins are not moving away from each other. They are if you are measuring things from outside the box, but inside the universe where everything is expanding at once, you cannot see the expansion. It comes, the information is given to you in terms of redshift because light doesn't travel inside the physical universe. It doesn't obey the rule, the, the clock speed meter rule. But as it expands, and as it expands, of course, the expansion is responsible and necessary for sustaining the force of gravity. That's what the pond Revka experiment is telling you. So note that for the expanding meter to still be a meter and preserve the laws of physics, it is necessary that clock speed and wavelength expand in proportion with it. This matches the pound Rebka experimental results. That's what it's telling you. And in addition, you know, distant celestial objects, stars out there in the galaxy, do recede from each other when observed or measured outside the box at exactly the same rate that we see a Doppler shift in light from those two points. And we can see that the Doppler shift that we see is proportional to mass. And so the property of expansion is proportional to mass. 
twice the mass, twice the rate of expansion, twice the gravitational, the opposite force of gravity. And this is matches what we see in the fixed positions of distant stars. It doesn't have anything to do with relativity. They are redshift in proportion to their mass because they're receding away from each other. In proportion to their mass, at a rate proportion to their mass. Found Rebke proved that the expansion of space is responsible for their observed redshift and clock speed changes, changes in the length of a meter and the speed of light. And the acceleration of light, which dissipates within a very short period of time. And the acceleration of light you can clearly see is propagated by the expansion of space away from the earth. It's exactly opposite the rate of falling bodies. So the force of gravity matches the force of expansion perfectly. The rate of falling bodies is the same exactly as the accelerating acceleration of expansion of light into space because the light is telling you the truth. It's telling you the space is expanding, but matter cannot do that. All right, so there's several animations in my videos that that may be of some further help in conceptualizing how internal cosmic expansion into an external dimension enforces the fixed dimensions internally and how accelerating expansion produces the equal and opposite force of gravity. That's what the facts are telling you. Listen to them. That's how you interpret them. You don't say, oh, God, praise Einstein. Okay, you've been bamboozled. With a bit of study, you can get perfectly comfortable with these dynamics and clearly perceive the truth for yourself. Don't listen to the big bangers. Don't listen to all that stuff. You want to know the truth? Here's where you get it. The truth of gravity and the reason why the internal measurements of space and time are eternally fixed as mass M, radius R, and the rate of expansion, actually the accelerated rate of expansion because the acceleration of expansion at the incremental value of C is what sustains the internal force of gravity, the gravitational potential of the universe as a whole and the surface of the universe that we know we've proven that the rate of expansion is proportional to the mass and that as a whole has to equal the speed of light because the expansion of space as we've seen is what propagates light. Light doesn't travel except as being propagated. It has no, it isn't being shot out of a cannon like they say, it's being propagated by the internal expansion of space. That's the source of gravity. Even though there's no measurable expansion of space internally, and there cannot be because everything is expanding in proportional to its own mass. But that means there could have never been a big bang. Unless for some reason, Newton's G may have maybe gradually deteriorating or something, but we'll talk about that later. No, there's no possibility of any kind that there ever could have been a big bang. <laughs> Here's the proof, okay? Pay attention. All right. Okay, so take a look at these pool balls, huh? Kind of cute. So what we're talking about so far, of course, we're talking about facts that have been verified by properly combining the known facts of clock speed, frequency, and length of a meter stick. So this illustration depicts uh, pool balls of different masses that represent or stand for celestial bodies somewhat distant from Earth, uh, other suns in the galaxy or something like that. And each shows a different rate of recession matching a redshift core proportional to its own mass. So the little ball is still kind of blue and the middle ball is getting to the green or yellow and the, and the nine ball is, uh, a mass of nine and it's expanding very, very quickly, but in each and every case that expansion matches the, the expansion of space because that's what the light is telling you that space is expanding. The redshift is telling you that space is expanding away from itself. 
but internally it looks fixed. Okay, you're just going to have to accept it because that's what the data says. That's what the data say. So, um, well, here's an animation. Okay, take a look at the animation. Uh, maybe that helps you see it. Huh? So the balls with more mass, the more mass they have, the faster they recede away, the more of the redshift, but the measurable distance within the box is fixed. Can you see it? Okay. Well, we know what the physicists will say. Okay, I only want to hear from the mathematicians. We know what the physicists are going to say. It's like the police have got a dead body on the floor and there's a man in front of them holding a knife covered in blood <laughs> with a T-shirt that says, it was me. <laughs> I killed him. And they're like, I don't know, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Okay, so in this animation, we can visualize watch light accelerating away. And we can see that it's accelerating because we're outside the box. And where the effect of gravity is felt, light will accelerate away, not with a constant redshift, but with a progressively greater wavelength, exactly matching the increased length of a meter, the expansion of space. Okay. So, this is a pretty good way, I thought, to visualize what actually is happening. This is what we've been talking about. This is what the facts of the pound Repka experiment tell us. Okay, we see here that the man, this is on the right, that's inside the box. That's us because we're made of mass, we're part of the box. And because of that, we feel ourselves falling towards the earth, even though it's the earth that's expanding. From outside the box, we can see it's actually the earth expanding towards us. This is something Einstein himself said at one point. I think maybe he did know the truth. And he wasn't just confused. Sure looks that way. Okay, so what we see here is that as the Earth expands, it's pushing light away. Light is propagated by the expansion of space. We don't perceive it inside the box because as everything expands in direct proportion with everything else, the laws of physics remain exactly the same. That's what the experiment is telling you. All right, so, so pay attention. And we see here exactly what the physicists will tell us about the blue shift towards the Earth, towards the mass and the red shift going away. And they call that gravitational red shift. And then if there's a body out there that's fixed and uh, they call that gravitational red shift, even though we know better now, we know that it's expanding, but we, you know, our meter sticks are expanding with it. And that's important because this is what gives us the force of gravity. The closer you get to a source of mass, the faster the expansion, force of expansion, and that produces the equal and opposite force of gravity. Where did I say that? Okay. Um, well, let's go on. Um, note that in this that with this expansion and this is what the pound replica experiment is proving it tells us that it's mathematically perfect okay it's the only explanation you can come up with and it is also what the michelson morley experiment proved not einstein the whole thing was a fake again honestly what did it prove about relativity that you know nothing because it didn't tell anything about relativity This was the Michelson and Morley experiment was supposed to be the third and final validation of Einstein's relativity. It was a big famous thing, you know, and one of the others, they gave him a ticker tape parade in New York, for God's sakes. And 
And like the other two, it says absolutely nothing about relativity. We saw that with pound rep. You saw it for yourself, okay? And here you're seeing again. Tell me what it says about relativity. It doesn't say anything about relativity. It says that light is propagated in all directions at the same time. And that's why Michelson Morley came up with light being of equal velocity in all directions, assuming it's un, in an equal mass density, potential energy level. Yeah, that's why they put it in a vat of mercury, okay? Yeah, and then they lied a little bit, didn't they? Because the moon is pulling the tides around out there. It's definitely gonna screw around with that interferometer a little bit. So they lied saying there was no difference because you know better because as the light is, is is going into that region of space towards the moon it, it isn't that it's going to speed up because the speed of light is you know it's because the expansion of the moon is pushing back and so it's going to slow it down just a little bit so when it comes back it'll be okay so they they, they fudge the data a little bit well we get the point okay we accept that point we accept the point that meters shrink clock speed shrink and all of that with the pound rep kit. And we accept the point that light is actually propagated by the expansion of space. And that's why it has an equal velocity in all directions at the same time. It ain't photons being shot out of a cannon, like they say. And the raisins aren't expanding away from each other. The distance between the raisins is staying the same, even though the raisins are expanding away from each other, you know, outside the box, but we don't see that inside the box. Light is a passive agent. It is propagated only by the expansion of space in all directions simultaneously. It it's just gets pushed around, that's all. It just gets pushed around. It doesn't have any weight of its own. So that's why it has the same velocity in all directions. The Michelson-Morley experiment proved the cosmic expansion model as a fact. They didn't say jack about Einstein's relativity. This was just cooked up like everything else. Use your head. The velocity of light is exactly equal to the in, inward to outward rate of expansion of space, whatever it might be. That's what Michelson and Borley proved. Okay, so let's go back here and, and let me fix this mistake that I made in the last video where I said that G could not be changed in such a way, okay, as we know that it would actually allow for an expanding universe where the raisins are moving apart from each other, because that would require a reduction in mass density, and the formula just can't allow for that. Anytime we re try to reduce density by adjusting the variables, it makes it, you know, it, it increases the force of gravity, so you can't have an expanding universe, okay? And then I said that the value of G would be, would vary with the expansion or with the, ex yeah, with the um, mass density, well, it would vary with the speed of light as the speed of light moved through various areas of differing mass density, higher mass density, a higher velocity of light and a lower mass density, a lower velocity of light, okay? So uh, you have a higher, you know, so, I said G is, you know, basically a, uh, it assumes a uniform density throughout. Well, I was wrong about that. As you can see, you, you can't be, make it in such a way that it can allow for a big bang or an expanding universe in that sense, but um, it can't vary for any reason whatsoever. It's, okay, why? Because, okay, what I didn't, what I wasn't, I wasn't thinking and give me a break here. You know, I mean, I've only been thinking about some of this stuff for a little while. I'm bound to make a mistake or two somewhere online, but it's not a big deal. But basically the speed of light and acceleration of light is proportional to the mass density, ambient mass density in that region of space. So if the acceleration of light or the speed of light increases, for that reason, then no, the value of G will still remain constant. Why? Because the mass density will decrease at the same rate. And look at the 
look at the other factors in G. You know, it's uh, uh, radius squared over mass times uh, acceleration of light. Okay, so the inverse of mass density actually times the increase in light, speed of light ensures that G must always at all times remain G. It must have exactly that value, just like a meter stick will have the value of a meter stick no matter where you take it. Even though the variables inside may change, the meter stick is just is still the same and the value of G is constant. There's no way you can make a change for an expanding universe, not in the sense that the cosmologists are telling you because they based all of their ideas on a fraudulent science of Einstein. That's what I'm telling you. Okay, so uh, take it for what it is. That's, I'm telling you the truth. Okay, now <clears throat> this will be the first time I've talked about the E equals MC squared fraud. You know, the, the thing that really makes Einstein famous, you know, not that the other stuff don't, you know, but whatever. So I've shown clearly how the Einstein credit for pound repka is an obvious example of scientific fraud that has no rational defense, and yet they got away with it, okay? And it makes it easier to spot the other fraudulent claims of Einstein, such as they all are, and that includes E equals MC squared. So in every case, you know, the modus operandi is one of Newton's formulas is plagiarized and and twisted around and the meaning extended to falsely claim credit for some new discovery, which may or may not be new and may not, may not really be a discovery, but at any rate, the, he gets a credit for it, you know, and that, that's the way the script, the history books read. So the E equals MC square swindle isn't as blatant as what we saw with the pound replica, but we can be confident that the formula was hijacked from Newton and that a more scientifically valid explanation for a new phenomena can be found than the one offered by Einstein. Of course, for E equals MC squared, this is primarily the phony mass energy conversion ID idea, which forms the basis of Einstein's popular fame. You know, he's saying that this is what is happening inside the sun, and this is fusion, and a certain amount of mass is lost, and all these yeah, nuclear fusion reactions. I don't know much about it, but I know that 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 there isn't any mass being lost. Okay. So we want to talk about this. So this idea that the merging of two hydrogen nuclei in the sun releases energy from the conversion of mass, that's got to be wrong. There's something wrong there somewhere. The exception to the formerly immutable law of conservation of mass and energy, oh, that marks Einstein is the greatest scientific mind of all time. Again, he was, he proved, he found an exception, but he didn't, okay? The claim is just backed up by a bastardized version, bastardized version of the standard chemical reaction formula where the loss of mass as a reactant is indicated as the equivalent gain in energy as a product. Well, that's what that's what the nuclear physicists are trying to tell you. You know, this is a chemical. No, no, no. There's no way to measure the alleged loss of mass in any atomic reaction where the restoration of mass can be demonstrated. There is none, no such case ever because the claim is fake science in the light of day. The energy is coming from somewhere else. You know, it's, it's coming from the release of a particle because of the binding force at such a short range. And a proton is probably the highest mass density in anywhere in the universe. And so over a very short range where uh, expansion is effective, you know, the force of gravity on that level has got to be a million times more. And that's the energy that you see being released if you dislike something that's being held in there. So Einstein's claims and his ongoing uh, References to those claims are also fraud by definition. The classic law of conservation of an energy and mass could not be violated, and any sensible person can see that that is not what is happening. He just can't explain the, the uh, 
energy, binding energy of protons and neutrons um, as response, you know, you can't explain it any other way because he missed the boat with the expansion of mass being the force of expansion being proportional to its mass density. I mean, it's got to be super intense at that level. And that's what's being released. It's not a conversion of mass. Okay, so, but, so this, this formula is more bull roar, but let's examine where the E equals MC squared formula was hijacked from. Okay, we can do that. We, okay, we, here's some, formulas that we can look at up here is E equals MC squared. It comes from Newton's formula for potential energy where potential energy is equal to MGH equals MV squared, MV squared, okay? A lot, if we change, you know, a small velocity and we, we, we get to the speed of light, then it's a different formula. And it's also could be taken from Newton's formula for kinetic energy. They're basically the same thing. Mass times the velocity squared between two points. The change in velocity squared times the mass. That gives you your kinetic energy. And before it happens, it's your potential energy. This is the, this is the kinetic energy for an inelastic collision. You know, you, you drop your phone and it hits the floor, you know. Uh, kinetic energy equals mv squared. And we showed also that, the, okay, because this getting to understanding, explaining what this is about, what where he gets this formula, we showed that the change in velocity over distance or what it means over distance h is equivalent to the rate of expansion near Earth's surface. That would be 9.8 meters per second per second, right? The acceleration due to gravity. And we prove conclusively that the surface gravitational potential of any body of mass is equivalent to its rate of expansion. That would be the acceleration due to gravity is because of the expansion of space, specifically the product of its mass is square of the velocity of expansion, which gives you the energy. So that rate of expansion V is precisely equal to the fractional change in velocity of light over the distance h offset by the same fractional change in the length of the meter. Therefore, since gravitational potential is proportional to mass, the gravitational potential near the surface of the universe must also be equal to its rate of expansion, which can only be the entire baseline speed of light, c squared. Einstein's formula just tells you the gravitational potential at the surface of the Earth or the rate of expansion of the surface of the Earth. That's all it tells you. It doesn't tell you that mass and energy can be converted. They have to think about this differently. They have to think in terms of, gra of, of it, the, the energy of expansion or microgravitation at the atomic level. That's, that's what they need to look at. And that's... <sighs> That's the only meaning that you could give this equation of Einstein's. It's just another bastardized, it's another plagiarized thing of, Einstein, of, of Newton's that he tried to make look different. And people just, you know, the news just by this time, you know, he was his big frenzy. Every word that came out of his mouth was like, you know, out of a, uh, out of a prophet or something. So this fractional change in light velocity at the surface of the year. Earth could only be the entire range of light velocity because light is propagated by expansion. So that's what E equals MC squared really means. It could be, you know, well, it could tell you the rate of falling bodies on the surface of the universe, you know, if that, if you happen to be, get out there far enough. So, uh, okay. So anyway, I don't pretend to have knowledge of uh, mass energy conversions or how they do that. I just know that there's, you know, that this energy that they're looking at from nuclear reactions has to do with the binding energy from the force of expansion, just like it causes gravity in the <clears throat> larger scale where matter is far more, far less dense. So my job is just 
tracing the energy and dynamics involved in the creation of atoms as they originate from cosmic expansion. All right, think about it. To start with, we need to only rely on the foundation of solid proof for the inner expansion of matter as the cause of the equal and opposite force of gravity it is now an established fact. If it never was before, and you can check me on this, tell me it isn't, please don't. However, unacknowledged that accelerating internal expansion is the fundamental property of matter, you know, and that is precisely matched by the equal and opposite force of gravity by Newton's third law. It just necessarily follows that cosmic expansion exerts the most powerful reactive forces on the smallest scale or the greatest mass density in protons and neutrons acting at the very smallest distance you can possibly imagine. Those guys are really hugging each other in there, all right? All right, we have proof of this. The rate of spatial expansion on the nuclear level would by definition be the most powerful binding energy and atoms the most powerful force in, in the universe because this is how, it's how the math works out. It's, it's how, how these forces behave, it, be very small or and depending on the mass density you know, in that region of space. And so anyway, so, so no doubts can really be entertained, can they, that the binding force of atomic nuclei is cosmic expansion, just as it is for gravity? Seriously, the force of micro expansion would be far greater than macro gravity by virtue of the extreme density of the proton and the tiny radius of an atomic nucleus. In larger atomic wastes, of course, it become unstable because <clears throat> the mass density begins to diminish as they try to crowd in there and they, and they just can't do it. <clears throat> with greater and greater numbers of protons and neutrons vying for the same space. Well, I'm just going to fall out of there rather easily. And this is where you get your, your unstable elements. They're willing to give up their binding energy fairly, fairly quickly. So there really isn't any argument about the construction of atoms taking place in stars, where the rate of expansion or opposite force of gravity, gravity results in extreme pressure. If the kinetics of macrogravity seem weak, consider that the kinetics of microexpansion would be extraordinarily more intense because they involve mass densities millions of times greater than the porous matter, like say of the Earth. You know, at ranges millions of times smaller. You know, the forces. You know, anyway, it's uh, it's proportional to the uh, product of the masses divided by the square of almost no radius whatsoever, almost nothing. So it would be impossible to deny that eternal expansion on the atomic level is solely responsible for binding forces between atomic particles. As a planet traps more mass and begins to boil over from the heat produced by kinetic collisions, protons are brought closer and closer together until the force of micro expansion results in their capture. The binding energy just the force required to grab onto them. And then atoms are built piece by piece from the capture of additional protons and neutrons under an increasingly intense pressure of internal ex internally expanding mass that is pushing them down. Once these, uh, once this material like is released from a supernova, the intense packing energies of captured particles and in the nucleus, they remain there by virtue of ongoing internal expansion. The star brought them together and now they stay together. Whoever prays together stays together. So if any protons or neutrons are by any means dislodged from these tiny little orbits, enormous quantities of energy will follow. It comes right out of the sun. The binding energy of expansion or the reverse and opposite uh, force of expansion, okay? So the energy so released has nothing to do with the loss of mass. It's only the short range binding energy locked in from internal expansion that formerly prevented it from escaping its tiny orbit. And I'm sure that fusion has something to do with that too, okay? It's a release of a neutron, I'm pretty sure. So obviously the energy attributed to fusion is misleading because fusion by itself, I mean, that doesn't release energy. It has to be the release of some other particle. 
that frees the energy of expansion that has been holding them captive. And that being said, there is no need to further entertain the misplaced notion that the energy released from atomic nuclei has anything to do with a loss of mass or that the formula E equals MC squared MC squared represents any such thing. This is pure and simple plagiarism and fraudulent science as Lewis Essen, the inventor of the atomic clock, explains so well, but nobody listens. Oh, all right, okay, okay. All right, so uh, almost as an afterthought, you know, I always wondered about the entropy paradox, you know, if every, each and every, any action or reaction in the universe increases the state of order, decrease, increases the state of disorder of the universe, then the universe will eventually, you know, wind down and dissipate into nothing. And this is what the big bangers have been telling us that exactly that, okay? Well, uh, no, okay, you understand that the, okay, well, let's just, let's just, an incidental significance of atomic construction that we've just been talking about should be the most important scientific discovery after the cause of gravity. You know, it's well established that the dynamics of all physical and chemical actions and reactions require a net loss of energy, irreversible loss of energy, which forbids the operation of a perpetual machine, which would, of course, somehow restore this loss. But no chemical or physical reaction known to man violates the second law of thermodynamics that says the state of disorder must always increase. <laughs> so there's no perpetual motion machine. But the fundamental property of matter, as we see, is expansion, accelerating expansion itself. We have a perpetual motion machine, a perpetual force, the only perpetual motion machine to ever be seen, which restores order to the universe by the creation of new atoms and stars, of course. There you go. So this fills that paradoxical gap in the science of thermodynamics because if every action or reaction results in an increase in the entropy of the universe, we have yet to answer for how order came to be in the first place. The, the big banger stuck us up to imagine that the universe began with perfect order at the moment of the big bang and has been winding down ever since. But as the, as the races dissolve into nothingness, you know, there's maximum disorder order and universal death inevitably result. But <laughs> we see now that doesn't happen. But the absence of entropy, entropy cannot possibly be compatible with the high temperatures of the Big Bang. Think about it. The highest, the most extreme temperatures represent the greatest entropy. So we start with nothing. We start with no order. How can that be? You know, it's just more, it's more evidence, more proof that this Big Bang stuff is all just uh, you know, made up, okay? So if the Big Bang begins with maximum disorder, it would be quite a, impossible odds with the second law and the model of the universe cannot be correct unless it provides some mechanism for negative entropy, the restoration of order. And this is satisfied by the perpetual motion of the accelerating cosmic expansion model. There you go. Okay, so we see quite clearly now our eyes, have, the scales have been removed from our eyes and we see that the forces of internal cosmic expansion are, is, are the powers that drive the cosmos, is the power that drives the cosmos. And this means that the creation of atomic nuclei is the top down primary negative entropy event. The restoration of order, which is followed by increased en entropy in every secondary chemical or physical action or reaction. The second law of thermodynamics has to be amended to state or include that all physical and chemical action in actions increase the entropy of the universe, except for the creation of matter and stars through the forces of internal expansion. 
This is the sole transaction of energy that restores order to the universe, the perpetual motion machine of cosmic expansion, the formation of atoms inside of stars. So we might ask ourselves how atoms are recycled. Okay, the materials formed in stars are eventually liberated by a supernova. Okay, the star blows up and all of these goodies that has been assembled inside the star are spread all over the place. Okay, and they probably are nearing their expiration date by the time they come together to make you or a human body. The steady state cosmic expansion model of the universe, which is fact, not theory, requires that the raw materials of subatomic models be continually reassembled eternally. But how are they broken down? Well, I guess that should be no mystery. I mean, uh, I don't, I can't provide you any specific scientific evidence, but I think that matter is eventually trapped by the furious expansion of black holes where it is broken down into its fundamental parts and redistributed by those powerful jets are cosmologists gleefully observe and show to us all over the internet. So there you go. Well, I wanted to tell you this story about Humpty Dumpty falling off the wall perpetually, but it's just kind of a cute story. So at about age nine, you know, I was killing time in the waiting room of this dentist by, you know, the guy that always put the mercury in on, the, on your dime so that you get poisoned by lethal mercury, the vapors when you leave. But anyway, I was reading this issue of Humpty Dumpty magazine while I was waiting for the guy to call me in there. And it had an article telling how to make a, a self-starting siphon by bending a small tube of glass, you know, and the surface tension of water carries it up as far as the bend and then gravity pulls it over the top of a beaker and blah, 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 drips all the way out, you know. It's, you've experienced that if you let your arm hang over the bathtub too far, you went to sleep and you wake up and you find the water's all over the goddamn floor, you know, it's self-started siphoned out, you know, using your, the skin between you and, well, anyway, I raised my hand in physics class years later and I said to the professor, I can make a self-starting siphon. And he, he, of course, laughed and said that would be impossible. You know, that would be a perpetual motion machine, the dreams of fools. And I said, OK, then and I left to the lab real quickly. And, uh, and, I, and I made one of these things. And I came down real quickly with a beaker of water. And I demonstrated it in class in front of you know, 40, 50 people. And, and oh, I, I guess that wasn't very nice of me, but he objected anyway. He said, it's not fair because I'd made a second bend upwards, you know, which I did that made the water bounce a little bit. I knew he was going to say that. So I made another one. You know, I knew he was going to try to squirm out of it. So I made another one and I pulled this one out. And it didn't have a bend. And of course, it turns out that gravity itself is, in fact, a perpetual motion machine. You know, I guess it's rain, always raining somewhere in the universe. You know, these, this is, it's a perpetual eternal cycle. There was no big bang. Okay. Well, it, I got to call it a night. I'm tired. Thanks for hanging with me. And I hope that I got through to you this time. Bye. Hold on. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, uh, an important thing is the progressive intergalactic redshift that the Big Bangers tout as proof of our expanding universe. Expanding in the sense that these celestial raisins are moving apart at an accelerating rate. That's their, their current uh, body politic. <laughs> Hence, they project an entropic death of the universe by progressive dilution as stars drift away into oblivion, disappear and drift away. So our universe is dying and entropy is proof of that. Well, it was this correlation with distance that led Hubble to cave after much resistance and agree that the raisins must be moving apart. It, it was hard for him to accept that even though he's the one who was measuring this redshift and documenting it. So then Einstein also 
finally was required to cave and admit that admit to his famous greatest blunder uh, and agree that his cosmological constant, which is plagiarized, it's most more correctly Newton's G, he decided that it must in fact be a variable. Though anyone, anyone can clearly see from the units of G that this isn't possible. Uh, we've gone over that many times and that's why the textbooks don't say much about the meaning of G. So it wasn't until Einstein's so-called tragic blender, blunder, uh, it wasn't just a blunder for him, it was the death of physics. It was the death of cosmology. And at this point, we'll never be able to enlighten him. But can we explain the progressive intergalactic redshift? So being progressive with distance, it isn't like the so-called gravitational redshift between the fixed stars in our galaxy, but it must be recessional redshift, or so they say that the raisins are going bye-bye into oblivion. But the raisins are not moving apart. And to explain why, we recall that the property of cosmic expansion is outward acceleration not just uniform expansion, but acceleration. And this results in the retrograde force of gravitational attraction. So this will produce greater redshift as light accelerates away. And that's what we see, this progressive redshift close to the body of mass, close to the Earth. As light leaves the Earth, it, be, it accelerates. Okay, and, uh, and the redshift is great at first and then tapers off. Uh, with the square of the radius of the distance. So this force of acceleration and reverse retrograde force of gravity is very short range. And it'll disappear after leaving a, it'll disappear and be replaced with a steady redshift indicating uniform recession outside the box. While the same objects or shall we say raisins retain their fixed distances inside the box. So, you know, it's important to note that the effect of gravity in accelerating expansion never entirely reach zero. They just rapidly, the force becomes rapidly too small as the denominator gets large, the radius, the distance from the mass gets larger, and it becomes effectively zero in short order, but it never, never becomes entirely zero. And so meanwhile, the universe as a whole expands at the rate of big C, which is the accumulation of little c's per second over billions of years. It accelerates at the incremental rate of additional little c every second. So the actual outer side of the, of the universe and rate of expansion after billions of years would probably fill a library, library of Congress with exponents of 10. Even though our measuring instruments will record fixed size of the universe and fixed distances between stars in, the own, in our own galaxy and a fixed speed of light, little c. So this incremental additional acceleration at the rate of little c of the universe as a whole is too insignificant to be detected on the galactic level. It's meaningless, it's tiny, it's nothing. But over billions of light years, this accumulated acceleration of big C will eventually surface as an additional redshift that increases with time and distance. You see it's progressive, this little sliver of incremental increase in the rate of the overall expansion of the universe. So the difference in rates of expansion due to acceleration gradually pile up between now and then. So this accumulation of tiny differences in rates of expansion between now and then is what the cosmologists wrongly conclude proves that raisins are drifting apart inside the box at an accelerating rate and not realizing that this component of gravitational redshift is but a tiny fraction of the total difference in accumulated expansion necessary to sustain gravity.
So it only means that this tiny incremental acceleration, this sliver of internal expansion of the universe as a whole eventually surfaces as a tiny small additional progressive component of gravitational redshift on the intergalactic scale. It just means that the universe, like all bodies of mass, has a gravitational potential equal to its mass times the rate of expansion, big C squared. It does not mean that the raisins are moving apart. So we have an explanation for the gravitational redshift that the physicists observe simply by realizing and proving and pushing Einstein aside and realizing that accelerating expansion is necessary to sustain the force of gravity. Uh, so um, that should be enough for this video and I hope I was able to reach you this time. Alphus, thank you.